food. There's an African saying that once you remove food from poverty, you significantly solve the problem of poverty. But I guess that's one of the things that the AFDB is acting on with this prediction that informs some decisions that Africa may lose up to $11 billion worth of food as the bank envisages a fertilizer crisis as AFDB, which is expected to affect food production by 20%. Where's all of this coming from? Find the details in this conversation that we will have just now with Professor Oyebanji Oyelan Oyeyinka, who is Senior Special Advisor on Industrialization to the President of AFDB. Thanks for joining us this morning, Prof. It's good to see you again. Well, first of all, uh, it's scary enough that uh, where we had a food crisis before the Russia-Ukraine war, and many, many people are ascribing more or perhaps worse situations on our hands if the war continues the way it is. And of course, the AFDB hasn't spoken quite loudly about that. But to, the, to lose food to the tune of $11 billion and a reduction in food production by 20%, that's quite dire. Indeed. What, can, can you speak yes, to us indeed. about that? Perhaps, yeah, many people uh, thank are wondering. Thank you for inviting me. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. No, this uh, is a convergence of crises, as you know. Uh, Africa is just overcoming the crisis of COVID, uh, overcoming the crisis caused by the... Um, crash in oil prices for especially oil producing countries and equally for all the other countries who experience the uh, break in the global supply chain during the COVID. And now we have uh, Ukraine-Russia war, uh, which as you heard the statistics, uh, these two countries combine uh, export close to 30% of all the wheat, uh, maize and soya beans to around 28 uh, regional member states of African countries. So it is uh, the making of a perfect storm for us. And this is why Dr. Akumi Adishino uh, actually proposed this uh, emergency food production program for Africa. Uh, in fact, the bank is the first to come up with a very comprehensive program on this to combat uh, this food insecurity. Uh, and, you know, there are several components which we can talk about. But the overall goal actually is to ensure that we meet this head on. Uh, those figures are really very frightening, considering that uh, COVID itself threw millions, uh, millions of people already under poverty. Uh, and you know that whenever you have increase in food prices, inflation in food prices, uh, the poor are the most vulnerable. They are the ones that are first affected. Of course, these days, uh, there's very little distinction between the poor and the middle class in Nigeria, for example, and in many African countries. So we need to meet this uh, challenge head on. So this is what the bank is doing, and this is why the visit to the president in the last two days uh, by the president of the bank to actually brief uh, the country. And I, I, let me say that uh, Nigeria has been extremely concerned. The president of Nigeria has actually uh, been uh, making inquiries uh, asking about what is going to happen with this and how the bank is going to help. So as you know, there was a recent uh, IMF World Bank Spring meeting in Washington uh, from where the president came and all the finance ministers of Africa actually met on this issue. So it is a serious crisis. It is really the beginning of a perfect storm. But there are mitigation measures. Well, and if we take those mitigation measures very seriously, I think we'll be able to uh, uh, really attenuate the impact. Well, you know, Prof, the, one of the challenges that uh, we can cite as uh, people who have been in the country and who have seen the way things run over time is that whenever we have an, we always have emergencies. And when we have emergencies, we deal with them as emergencies. And almost right after that, the, we, we're back to where we were, and of course, that situation that we averted previously is going to come back. Now, talking about food, we have had conversations around our food production capacity over the years. So there are so many things that we have left undone 
over the years. Now, we're talking about a, an emerge, a food emergency production plan now, which we'll, we'll detail in a bit. But what's the assurance we have that this emergency food production plan will actually help us not just to get out of the, the, the danger zone or the, the waiting perfect storm that you've talked about, but to actually have a sustainable program post this emergency? No, thanks. Actually, this is uh, really the, um, the plan. Uh, as you know, in the past, what normally happens is that a country or a region falls into this kind of crisis, and you have uh, World, Food Pri uh, World Food Program and all of those uh, aid agencies come, distribute grain, distribute corn to people uh, to mitigate those immediate effects. But the plan, the emergency security food plan, that the president has put in place is designed to actually uh, be sustainable. What do I mean by that? Uh, what you see here is a two-year program and two seasons, both wet season and dry season planting, uh, that will be consolidated thereafter. The idea is to ensure that Africa becomes a global food basket itself and not just uh, be beyond this emergency. And uh, as you know, in the past, I've spoken a lot about the special agro-industrial processing zone. Uh, there will be a consolidation, properly done, properly implemented. Once we get uh, all of this right by thorough coordination, uh, ensuring that we build all the infrastructure that we require for for the farmers, as you know, there are almost 70% of our population. Uh, the idea is that this will trigger rural industrialization and consolidate it with the special agro zone. So I, I really like your question because this goes beyond the current crisis. And by the way, all the projection we see is that all of this is not going to end very soon. What the Ukraine-Russia crisis has triggered uh, some projected to last up to end of 2023 before we even begin to see some level of normality. Because as you see, as you know, for example, a lot of uh, uh, supply chain has been broken because all of those corridors, uh, the Black Sea and all of those areas where food comes from, where energy are transported from, gas pipelines, you see all the argument, for example, now between uh, uh, the Europeans and Russia, uh, they are all going to add to the cost of insurance and they transmit uh, immediately into, into prices of food. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, not going to be a short-term uh, crisis. Uh, this is an external shock that it has a, a potential to generate longer-term impact. So we have to respond on a longer-term basis and provide sustainable, deep-going solutions. And this is the way the president sees it, sees the crisis, sees the moment. And this is why we are providing the global leadership on this. In fact, the bank is the only one that has actually come up with a plan such as this. Uh, and, you know, colleagues all over the world, they recognize it, what the, what the president has done to put on this. And it's getting huge support uh, right. from all the big partners. Well, Prof, uh, just to be clear, when you say president, I I'm always tempted to think president of Nigeria, but I imagine you're saying president of the AFDB. Am I right? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. So, so let's I'm talk talking more. about the president of the AFDB. All right, so, so let's talk more about this emergency food production program said to uh, be worth $1.5 billion. By the way, it's been said that uh, it's waiting to be approved by the board of the bank, but it holds so much potential. And I think a lot of Nigerians, Africans at large, and perhaps the world, will be waiting to hear at least the details, the much you can give us. So tell us, is this a Nigerian thing, or as the name connotes, an African thing that would involve farmers across Africa? Can you break this down further for us? So it involves all of Africa. Actually, the, uh, the restriction from uh, uh, caused by the uh, uh, Ukraine-Russia war and the inflation trend that you find actually affects almost 28 African countries. So all of these countries have been targeted. 
for this $1.5 billion uh, emergency food plan. Uh, but of course, we were explaining the Nigerian component of it to our Nigerian president. Uh, the Nigerian component uh, is going to be about $140 million. And by the way, uh, since last year, we've actually been working on an emergency food security program uh, due to COVID. It's called NEFC, National Emergency Food Security uh, Initiative. Uh, so the, those two actually merge uh, now with the bigger global program. So the idea is to target about 5 million farmers to provide additional 9 million tons of, of food, uh, grains, uh, maize, rice, soya beans, sorghum, and uh, of course uh, wheat during the dry season. Uh, for, the, for the wheat, for example, this is a big concern because Russia and Ukraine between them provide almost 30% of all global green uh, wheat supply. And beyond that also, there's also the issue of fertilizer. Prices of fertilizer are risen like three times uh, because between those two countries and Belarus, which is, has become almost an ally of Russia, for example, uh, is also another place where you find uh, fertilizer coming from. So all of the inputs into guaranteeing food security have been affected. So we are, the food plan is actually addressing all of them. Inputs, uh, fertilizer, coordination, uh, and uh, you know, uh, high yielding varieties of uh, all of those uh, food crops that I, I, I mentioned. So, it is, so the Nigerian component uh, is what is being articulated. Uh, is almost $200 million when you add what we have uh, from the NEFC to it. And I hope that properly and uh, urgently implemented. Uh, and by the way, you mentioned the idea of the board. Uh, the hope is that before the end of May, this will be approved and it will be rapidly deployed in all of the African countries, not just in Nigeria. But of course, the, the meeting between the two presidents, the AFD president and Nigerian president, actually was to discuss the Nigerian aspect of it because the federal government has been extremely concerned about it. Because when you have hungry people, you have angry people. Uh, we already have the lasting impact from COVID. We haven't been able to go get rid of it. Now this comes along. So I think uh, any responsible government would like to really see the end of this. At least let's mitigate it as much as possible, especially for the poor people. So because I, I, anytime I see. you have high food prices, the poor suffers. Absolutely. And I see what, what this is yes. about. So there's a perfect storm, as you have put it, but there's a possibility, there's this potential to rise above that storm. In fact, ride the storm, essentially. And, and, and I love the proposal, maize, sorghum, soybeans, in fact, wheat. But, I mean, we've had, and, and you know, I hate to, to, to take this back, we've had programs, I mean, lovely programs, and, you know, targeting the right kind of people, farmers, targeting the right kinds of crop the right kinds of problem that we need to solve. But how do you plan to operationalize this? Maybe learning from the previous ones we've had, maybe not from the AFDB, perhaps from, you know, governments and all that. What is going to be different about this one? Or let me just say, how will they be operationalized? How will the farmers be selected? What kind of support will they get? And um, for how long, if, if this is between $140 million to $200 million, just how long is this going to be? I, I know I packed a lot, but... I know you can unbundle it for us. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, you know, you are right uh, because we know that um, programs like this, uh, where it unravels or where it succeeds, is at implementation stage. Uh, so the way it is designed is that it's mostly going to uh, use for procurement of inputs, fertilizer, uh, heat-resistant uh, varieties of wheat, for example. Uh, drought resistance, uh, varieties of uh, uh, grains like ma uh, rice and uh, maize and all of that, uh, and to use technology. If you remember very well when Dr. Akumia Odishino was here as minister, uh, this, the so-called GES that he operated was based on a, an ICT-based uh, system, a platform that puts into the hands of farmers directly the inputs. So the way it used to be operated was that it, the, the federal government will use part of this money, for example, to pay part of that, I don't want to use subsidy, uh, but it's a growth enhancement sort of scheme. 
so the federal government, this money, for example, will pay, uh, let's assume, 25%. Uh, states will pay, say, 25% as was done with GSGS, and then the farmers will pay 50%. So effective, effective subsidy in the hands of farmers is that you only need 50%. So you mitigate the, that, that cost, the additional cost that, you, that is coming out of all of these shocks that we have. So this is the way it's going to operate. It's going to be directly into inputs. Uh, and we've had several discussions also. Uh, the National Food Security Council, um, which is headed by the president of Nigeria, uh, we've had discussion with them on how best to make sure that this is effectively done, because it's going to need a lot of coordination coordination between officials, uh, agro-dealers, the farmers themselves, uh, seed companies. Uh, and the good thing is that we have experience in this. We have experience in this, unlike the COVID problem, where the country wasn't prepared, just like many countries weren't prepared. For this, we have experience. It's been done before. Uh, when Dr. Adishino was uh, Minister of Agriculture, it's been done, it was tested, and they produce at that time 21 million tons of additional food. So I think we have the experience. If we rally together as a country, coordinate together as all the big uh, uh, stakeholders, I have, no, I have no doubts in my mind that this can be done. So it needs leadership, it needs focus, it needs vision, uh, it needs collaboration of all the key actors. So asking, say, how can it be done? It can be done. Let me give you an example. This same uh, wheat program was started here. Uh, it didn't work at that time. But in two countries where it had been experimented, uh, it's called Technology for Af Africa uh, uh, Agricultural Transformation. It's headed by my colleague, uh, Martin Fregene, and his, and his team. In Sudan, uh, they supply 65,000 tons of, of seeds, and these Sudanese were able to grow over 300,000 hectares in two seasons. They were able to reduce their food sufficiency by 50%. And it is projected by that those, that country in three years will be a net exporter of wheat. Same with Ethiopia. In the 2019-2020 season, Ethiopia produced 1.1 million tons of wheat using the same technology using the same model by the bank. So there is no reason, scientifically, when something works somewhere, you can make it work anywhere. This is it. So if it doesn't work, then it's our problem. This I, is I like really this the, perspective. Uh, the issue. I, I like yeah. the perspective you bring in, mm. Prof. But you know, there are two sides to this conversation, really. So there's the, you know, the emergency food program. There's also the special agro-industrial uh, processing zone, which is meant to, I think, cost about $540 million. And I'll take a quick detour yeah. here. We'll still get into those issues. But I kept thinking $1.5 billion for the African food production, emergency food production program, $540 million. I don't know if they are linked, but the quantum of that fund alone is huge. And I know for the uh, special agro-industrial processing uh, you know, program, you have support from you know other banks but the FDB is like the giver or do I say the lender that keeps giving where are these funds sourced from essentially I know this is basic but it's a question that nags my mind as well because this is huge and this is something you've been doing for a long time yeah so you know all of the African countries are member stakeholders of the bank so if you are a stakeholder uh, those are the benefits of being a stakeholder of the bank. You know, these are concessionary long-term loans. Uh, they are very cheap loans. Uh, so it is not difficult to, to imagine that uh, countries will want to have this kind of access to these monies. So for, for, the, for the special agro zone, for example, uh, it's a you know, multi-decade loan that is being given to the country. Uh, as, as we said, it's about $540 million. We have, uh, like you said, we have other partners. The bank's component is $210 million. IFAD, 170, uh, 140. Uh, Islam is talking about 170 million. So it speaks to the fact of partnership and the fact that people trust the bank. 
And we have other partners already lining up. And I should not forget also that the Bank of Industry is also a partner at the local level and uh, has promised to fund all of those uh, key actors who will locate in those zones. On the special agro zone, uh, I've spoken with you on this on several occasions. We have already concluded everything. The rest now is in the hands of the government of Nigeria to fast track the implementation. Some of the states, of course, have taken it into their own hands and they are already negotiating with the contractors, which is a very good thing. Oyo and Kaduna, for example, have already approached some companies. They've signed agreement to start. So it is a good thing, and we are hoping also that uh, from the government we'll have a new date to launch this project. As whether they are linked, they are linked in one way, for example. If we do this emergency program very well, as I said, over the next two years, and we get African countries to begin to produce to ensure their own food security, uh, then SAPZ becomes the consolidation mechanism in which case you now become a processor, a value-adding continent, rather than a raw material exporter. The, 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 this um, merge, this bridge that you just talked about now, uh, it goes, takes me back to the question my colleague asked earlier about operationalization of this f emergency plan. Now, you have told us several times that the SAPZ is government-enabled, private sector-driven. Um, so I'm wondering how the private sector is coming to play now, if it still has to be um, activated, so to speak, by government. Yeah, so the government-enabled uh, portion is what has happened now. Government asks the bank for a loan to build infrastructure across these uh, states. Uh, we have eight zones. And then we have 14 additional states already lining up. So government enabled it by asking for this loan from the bank because Nigeria government, for example, is the biggest shareholder of the AFDB. So it has access to AFDB. So it catalyzes the process. And that is the, it's a good thing. But the success of a zone, uh, you just imagine a supermarket. You build a supermarket or you build a Hilton Hotel, for example. Uh, the success of a Hilton Hotel is that you have 100% occupancy rate. Or you build a huge supermarket. If nobody comes to that supermarket to take the shops, then you fail. So this is why we, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, uh, sort of agreed with the government that these zones are going to be world-class built. They are going to be quality built. They are going to, we are going to ensure good governance so that they are managed properly. So the construction and the management will be world-class. Uh, and this is why those states, for example, approach those uh, entities. I don't want to mention, promote anyone here. But the kinds of companies you want are those who have done it before. Uh, those particular countries they built in Togo, in Gabon, and other places, and they are working. So, so the so we want to make sure. So the government has enabled is a catalyst to say, ALDB has a model. Uh, we want this model, and we we'll put financing behind this model. And by the way, even in in construction itself. One of the reasons we, we want to ensure transparency is that we also want private sector actors to be part of those who will own it, who will own those zones, okay. in, uh, in addition to managing those zones. Okay. Yeah. Now, that is understood. But is it the same template for the emergency, emergency food plan, this $1.5 billion two-year plan? Yeah, so the, the template for the emergency food is, uh, is an ICT platform. Uh, as I said to you, with the, it's almost akin to the uh, growth enhancement scheme that uh, Dr. Additional started in those days, uh, whereby you ensure that these inputs like fertilizer, high-yielding varieties, uh, and all of those things, they reach the farmers directly in a very transparent way. 
And this is what we need to ensure. That you don't have middlemen profiting from poor farmers. You don't have middlemen profiting from fertilizer corruption. Yeah. You but want the to question, ensure that this goes directly. How will it get? Is this something that the federal government is going to champion itself? Or there are some uh, agencies of government at the federal or state levels? So it is, uh, is this a combination of go uh, government and private. Uh, the uh, the uh, ICT platform and all of that are going to be run by some private entities. Uh, the government, of course, you need the government because it says the policies. Uh, the government uh, will be also the, as I said, a catalyst. Uh, but running this program uh, will be the farmers, both smallholder farmers, uh, smallholder farmers, medium enterprises. Uh, those are the real beneficiaries, and we want to ensure that they are involved in this all this coordination. There's actually uh, a national, well, you call it a national wheat innovation platform, that involves all of these actors. They have a meeting uh, based on the original one that I was telling you about called NEFSI. So it is an open platform where everybody is involved in uh, suggestions and bringing ideas and all of that. Uh, I know the public is always worried that uh, the money will go into the wrong hands, but we are also wanting to ensure that these inputs go directly to the farmers. Otherwise, otherwise it defeats the purpose. Well, I guess you answered the question before I asked it. But there is one other issue that a number of people always worry about, so to speak, and that is post-harvest losses. So. Uh, just, I think it was uh, late last year, we had from the Action Aid, for instance, that Nigeria lost up to 3.5 trillion naira worth of harvest, post-harvest, because for one reason or the other. One of the reasons that's been adduced is the logistic of transportation, to the point that some people are even suggesting, let's use tricycles to to move food from the farmlands into the city centers and all of that. And then, uh, but that's up from 25% in 2020, according to NSPRD uh, or so. So I'm wondering how has the, has be, has the bank, has, has the AFDB been able to think through this particular challenge as well of logistics in order that the efforts of production made are not whittled down by post-harvest losses. Yes, indeed. In, in fact, uh, this is one of the frameworks uh, designed into the SAPZ. Uh, for example, the SAPZ is not your usual uh, special economic zone uh, where you have only factories. Uh, factories built maybe around uh, ports or some airports uh, where you import the input. For example, if you are making garment, you simply input cotton and yarn and then process and export out. Now, the special agro zone, the special agro industrial processing zone is deliberately built within the peri-urban areas. And this is where you have all of those post-harvest losses. The idea is to move it closer to where the farmers themselves are. Uh, because without that, so within the, so you have those factories within those peri-urban areas, and then with deep within the communities themselves. And this is a, a unique feature of the special agro zone. We are also going to build what we call agri-transformation centers, which is ATCs. ATCs will comprise, uh, for example, drying facilities, uh, cooling facilities. It will include roads. It will include, for example, logistics that you talked about. Uh, so that, for example, if someone produces uh, cassava or some perishable. And the likelihood is that after a few days, there will be the possibility of that going bad. Uh, you have a drying facility or you cooling facility or whatever it is that we identify as the uh, 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 you know, particular commodities that is abundant in those particular areas. So each zone is designed in a very, very specific way to address that. In fact, you have put your, your hand on the major problem of post-harvest losses. And it's not just losses of income. It is losses of trust. 
if you have if you ask farmers to produce more and they produce more and then they lose all their produce and harvest next year they're not going to listen to you so we are going to put in place uh, all of those that will help them to mitigate those losses so within the ATCs uh, in fact some ATCs actually for themselves uh, almost like a hub of processing then from there you can then move to factories that will do the end production right so those are the thoughts that go into uh, into the uh, agro zones uh, that mm -hmm. we have designed uh, because this is very very peculiar to our situation Right, so still on this agro zones, I'll move on in a moment, but just to clear this one. So in the tweets put out by the president mm -hmm. of the AFDB, uh, you know, talking about the visit to the president and how, you know, the bank has mobilized $540 million, of course, in partnership uh, with uh, IFAD and the Islamic Development Bank. And, you know, he talked about seven states, uh, Kano, Kaduna, Oyo, by the way, you talked about those two earlier. Ogun, Kwara, Imo, Cross River, and of course the FCT. And there are questions that why isn't Benue, which we all know as a food basket of the nation, at least on that list? If, if, I mean, some would think maybe first mm -hmm. at least for its prominence in terms mm -hmm. of food, agriculture, and all of that. So I'd like you to perhaps shed more light on that. Why is Benue excluded? Yeah. No, uh, Benue wasn't excluded. In the beginning, uh, we had engaged with practically all the states, and we had constructed something called a readiness index uh, because you need several documentations, for example, uh, your feasibility study, environmental study, and all kinds of things that are required by these banks, all of these three partners. Uh, you, you need to have them ready uh, to, after your expression of interest. Some states were faster than others. Some were a bit slower. So, but what we decided uh, after a time, you, you know, we also lost one year because of COVID. Uh, we started the process in 2019, April, when President, Babangi, uh, President Buhari actually asked for the special agro zone. So we saw that we were losing time. And of course, also you don't have that quantum of money to cover all the 36 states. So we took a decision, okay, let's start with the first eight who have met the readiness index. So that's what we did. As I said earlier, there are 14 or 15 other countries, including Benue, including Kassina, Nasarawa, uh, Kebi, that, that are now lined up for phase two. This is, so they are also going to be included. Uh, SAPCs are going to be built in all of those states. Uh, and this is why we are in a hurry to begin to implement the first set. And I can assure you, that, you know, when, you, when private actors see what we have done, as it's happened in Ethiopia, you know, in Ethiopia, there are, they now have about 24 industrial parks, industrial zones. Uh, many of them are agro zones. Half of them are actually private, privately built. So what we are doing is actually uh, exemplars of what is possible. And I have seen farms that, uh, you know, I, I was talking to uh, a, a particular entrepreneur. I was so impressed. What he told me, this man is actually building a dam. And I was telling him, what you are doing here is actually almost like an SAPZ. So we are going to hope, and we are hoping that once folks see this first eight set of states, and then we begin to build the other states, Private sector people can build their own special agro zones. Uh, I know there are enough uh, people in Nigeria who have the money, who have the capacity to do that. So, well, Benue is not excluded. No state will be excluded. And I think uh, it, it's good you clear the air on, on that one. And just to reiterate the point mm -hmm. you made earlier, that I mean, it's now the ball is in the court of government. I mean, you have essentially done all you can, yeah. so waiting on government. But you know, all of this talk is even making me interested in farming because I'm thinking 540 million dollars <laughs> for the uh, you know processing zones and a potential uh, 1. 1.1.5 billion dollars, maybe 200 million dollars for Nigeria, particularly now. So I'm thinking now as a farmer, how should farmers position themselves to? take in all of this i want to call it largesse but of course <laughs> it's yeah. meant to, meant to be yeah. used for business and agriculture so how can they better position themselves uh, to partake in in this 
So uh, basically, uh, once all of this starts, uh, this is going to be open. So any farmer, whether you are doing maize, whether you are doing uh, soya beans, whether you are doing rice, uh, particularly wheat, we really want to encourage farmers to grow more wheat because of now we have all of this uh, heat resistant, climate adapted uh, wheat variety. Uh, we want Nigeria to become a net exporter of wheat. We want to ensure, because all of the bread and cakes and all of that you eat, uh, it takes a lot of money out of this country. We really need to stop that. Uh, so farmers should position themselves to be part of this. Uh, we are encouraging everyone to be part of this. Uh, at the state we're level, hoping... we are going to be doing a lot of advertisement. Yeah. Well, we're, we're hoping that you know, people, the communication will get to the right people. Prof, yes or no, yeah. is agriculture capable of fast-tracking Nigeria's economy? Modern agriculture, industrialized agriculture, is the only way to start an industrial revolution. Okay. Uh, you, that is how you start. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. It is I capable of, of fast-tracking our growth. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to get that out for those who, well, they, they know mm. themselves. Professor Oyebanji Oyelano Oyeyinka, Senior Special Advisor on Industrialization to the President of the Africa Development Bank. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. So... How are all these things going to be fast-tracked? It all starts with leadership. That's next. Stay with us.